It is my great honor to introduce Shafi Goldwasser. Uh, as her image here shows, she is uh, currently the director of the Simons Institute at UC Berkeley. That's the top one. She's a professor at MIT and a professor at Weizmann. Uh, but Shafi's greatness is not in the places that she is, but rather in how she's totally shaped our field as we know it. Um, with such amazing results, but this is only a limited uh, uh, list of things. Um, zero knowledge proofs, uh, information theoretic multi-party computations, semantic security, um, PCPs, uh, multi-provers, and the list just goes on and on and on and on. Um, she is the 2012 Turing Award winner. She has two Gettle Prizes. This is very rare. There are people who have one, but two is really very unique. She's the ACM Grace Hopper winner, RSA Award. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences. She's an ACM fellow, and she's an, also a fellow of our organization, of the ICR, which we're happy. Um, in 1980, my mother went to a pool and met another woman in that pool. And that woman told my mother that she has a, a daughter who is a graduate student at Berkeley and is very talented. My mother listened. But <laughs> the truth is, this was Shafi's mother, of course, but the truth is I think that even Shafi's mother underestimated this very unique, extraordinary, and unlimited talent that Shafi has, and really couldn't even imagine how Shafi would go on to change the world. So please, help me honor Shafi Goldwasser. So, thank you, Tara, for the introduction. I have to say that my mother may have uh, underestimated, but I also had a father. <laughs> And he was always overestimating. Uh, so uh, I think maybe on average, uh, maybe they got it right. But in any case, um, they're both gone, but they were quite something. So this is uh, the second time that I'm supposed to give this talk. And uh, some of you know, but this time I'm actually going to give it. And uh, in the meantime, I managed to change uh, affiliation or add an affiliation. Um, so the title of my talk is Cryptography and Machine Learning, What Else? So there's two ways to interpret this what else. One of them is that what else do people talk about these days uh, except for machine learning? But what I mean is uh, what else is there to do in addition to what people in the cryptography community are doing uh, when machine learning is concerned? And um, I've learned a tremendous amount preparing for this talk. I'm not an expert in machine learning. I'm an expert in cryptography. But if you learn even a fraction of what I've learned in preparation, then I think I, I would do a good job. But uh, beware that this is... Um, work in progress. Um, so I just want to say that this I actually attended the first crypto, which was in 1981. And uh, there's a subset of people here who were there as well. Not a large subset, but some. And uh, it was extremely exciting and extremely informal. So by informal, I mean both in, in the interactions between people, but also in the type of work that people were doing. They had great ideas, and they were presenting them. There weren't definitions yet, or, yes, or, or in a sense, what people agreed on what should be the definition. But it was uh, you know, incredibly uh, fruitful and, and uh, creative. Um, and uh, sometimes people like to say it sort of was when, when it was art and then later maybe turned more into a sort of a science form. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because I think we're in a similar place in some areas of machine learning um, today. So um, I just want to say that just to illustrate the fact that really crypto has gone a long way from being informal to being a part of theoretical computer science, that in the Simons Institute, which is for the theory of computation, it's an institute dedicated for theory of computation, there are going to be these three programs, one on uh, the, essentially data privacy. Um, maybe you can think of differential privacy when you think about data privacy, but there might be other definitions. Another semester is going to be about blockchains, and then a third semester is going to be about uh, lattices, fluomorphic encryption, other applications of, of hard problems on lattices. So it's become really a part of theoretical computer science uh, to such an extent that there's sort of a three-semester uh, continuation exploring this as part of theoretical computer science. But uh, not only, and in fact, probably this audience, to some large extent, 
uh, knows uh, all these con the consequences of cryptography on the world, right? Electronic commerce with RSA, um, you know, cryptocurrency, which are all the rage. You know, even quantum computing, in some sense, was really jump-started because of uh, Peter Shor's uh, factoring algorithm on a quantum computer when he was sort of trying to break RSA, and that was just so fascinating and illustrated the, the, the strength and power of quantum computers if they were built. And it's also become a part of theoretical computer science. Uh, sort of ideas from cryptography have led to probabilistically checkable proofs, which essentially gave an NP, the class NP, a new definition, pseudo-random number generation. So the impact of sort of cryptographic research has been incredible on the world, on the world of theory. And uh, I guess my point in this slide is that maybe what is sort of the next frontier, in my opinion, uh, or a next frontier, is really developing cryptography, which is friendly for uh, machine learning. And that's kind of going to be the thrust of my talk. And I think there's, which is going to be my ending slide, but I'll say it now, for those of you who are just going to uh, taper off, is that there are two opportunities here. One, which people are already doing, and that is using sort of cryptographic machinery that's been developed for many, many years, okay, in the space of, of machine learning. But the other one probably is developing theory, uh, new theory for cryptography, which uh, maybe is motivated by um, machine learning applications. So um, the outline of the talk is, first of all, there's going to be some historical part which, about the connection between machine learning and cryptography, which does not start today, but starts in the mid-80s. Then I'll talk about this uh, field, which I'll call safe machine learning. They could call it another name, but you'll see why safe is, is the word I use when I get to it. And that is sort of the challenges that are present today and, and the opportunities they present for cryptography. And finally, so, sort of sampling of what is already done about these challenges, which is no small thing. In some sense, it would have been better to give the talk last year because there are about 50 new papers, which I kind of had to at least skim uh, about the, uh, in, this, in this area. Within a year, that is. Uh, or shall I say that Vinod had to skim them and explain them to me, that to be <laughs> very disclosure. Um, so in any case, for those of you who need an introduction, I have a very short one. And that is machine learning is, you know, there's artificial intelligence. Machine learning is somewhere in the intersection of artificial intelligence, statistics, and theoretical computer science, the way I see it. And if I had to give just like a, a, uh, an explanation to my mother or my father or, or other non-technical uh, uh, literate people, I would say that essentially it, sh it, it explores how to come up with algorithms which can uh, essentially learn and make predictions on data without explicitly programming these algorithms. So without writing the, al the algorithm, somehow the algorithm will emerge from the data and then can be used to make predictions on uh, future data that we may encounter. Okay, so uh, essentially there are lots of machine learning models. We'll talk about a few of them here in this talk. But regardless of how you look at it, it seems like they all have two phases. Phase one is called usually the learning or training. So I'm going to use those terms again and again, learning or training. And what happens then is you're given some samples of input. So, uh, and you call this training data. Uh, these are, are uh, input which are usually labeled, so there's sort of some notion, like if it's a picture that there's a cat in it, or a dog, or a giraffe, or if it's a bank loan, if it's a, a, fe a feature vector that describes um, an applicant to a bank for a house loan, then uh, it might be labeled by let's grant the loan or not grant the loan, okay? Or it might be labeled by I'm going to grant a loan of a certain level, and so forth. Okay, so there's some notion of an input which describes uh, which might be a, it might, usually is a vector of features, and then there's a label, sort of a decision about that input. And uh, it's drawn from some uh, unknown distribution, really. So let's explicitly call this distribution D. This D is going to come up again and again. And uh, what the machine learning should do in the first phase is generate some sort of hypothesis about this data that has been seen. Sometimes it's called hypothesis. Sometimes it's called a model. These days it's called a model. In the 80s, we called it an hypothesis. And what do you do with this hypothesis? So what you do with this hypothesis uh, is uh, phase two, and you may do different things. So I enlisted three things here. You may essentially use this hypothesis to next time when you get uh, a new piece of data, not part of the training data, uh, it, it, you will assign, it's like a feature vector again in the examples that we talked about, a picture that may have a dog or a cat or a giraffe, uh, a feature of someone applying for a loan, and you're gonna use the hypothesis from the first phase to just make a decision on this new data. Another thing you could do is actually not worry about, not be interested in classification. Maybe you want to just generate new data, which is similar to the data that you've seen in the past. 
there's something about this distribution, you don't know exactly, you would like to come up with a, a, uh, maybe distribution D prime, which is hard to distinguish from D, okay? And um, a third thing you may want to do is just explain the data. So you just, you've seen all this data, you don't necessarily want to predict new data or generate new data, but you want to understand it. So if it's a distribution, let's think of it, let's say it's a geometric distribution, you want to know sort of what the parameters are, it's Bernoulli, you want to know what the probability of flipping the coin is, and so forth. So this is the way I see it, that there are these three uh, tasks that people are working on, classification, generation, and explanation, okay? And no matter which model we're talking about, these are sort of the two phases. So I'm not trying to put you to sleep. I know most people know this, but uh, you know, I'm just trying to put you in a good mood. Uh, <laughs> so in any case, so uh, let's be a little bit more concrete. So say there is this black box, and in it there's a formula, okay? Uh, let's say it's a, a DNF, so it looks like, uh, like a formula in three variables, and it's an, a, it's an or of ands, okay? And th this particular formula, um, a, and you know uh, that you could feed in, you know, x the x1, x2, x3, and out will come an output, but you don't know exactly what the formula looks like. This formula is extremely expressive. You know, you could say that it could be uh, x1, x2, x3, could be pixels or some sort of uh, some, uh, something that's been analyzed by a doctor to tell you whether a picture of a tumor is malignant or not. It could be uh, a bank loan which should be approved, if a suspect should be released on bail, or whether an email is a spam uh, or not, okay? So this is extremely expressive. So obviously, being that it's so expressive, wouldn't it be wonderful uh, that we could learn how we could learn C? It's hidden in a box. I don't know exactly what they do with x1, x2, x3, so that at the end they can give me these correct answers. So I'd love to learn how C works, um, but uh, that might be pretty hard. So how hard is it? So in order to tell, talk about this, even theoretically and formally, we need to really define what does it mean to successfully learn something, to successfully learn this box. And um, what information is actually made available to me about this hidden C? Is it just that it's locked in a box and I see examples, can I ask it questions, which is called membership queries? Maybe I can even see I, some information would leak about it. Maybe I can specify some of the variables and see the entire concept. There's uh, many different types of access you may think of. And in uh, 84, there's a fundamental paper by Les Valiant called The Theory of the Learnable, where he introduced a formal definition of what he means to successfully learn. This definition incorporates complexity theory, so he talks concretely about complexity theory and probabilities, okay? And this is a beautiful kind of anchoring place to look at in terms of how would you go about defining uh, success and failure and so forth. So this is uh, the definition. Um, and it essentially says, given these training examples, according, drawn according to some unknown distribution, he would say that a learning algorithm was successful, okay, if it approximately and probabilistically, a, 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 sorry, if it generated a hypothesis which agrees with the real concept, approximately with high probability. So there's sort of double hedging here. He says, you know, I only want with high probability, and you know, I don't want it to be exact, it just has to agree. Uh, most of the time, and he specifies the parameters epsilon and delta. Great, and efficient means polynomial time. Polynomial in, in what? In n, the length of the input, and the size of the description of the concept. So it allows us time to run in the size of the description of the concept. Great, so that's a definition. And uh, in the original paper, I think violence is very optimistic. You know, so he, first of all, he shows a bunch of positive results, you know, for monotone DNA formulas, some other classes, fairly small, simple classes, and he kind of, at least if you read it today, he's, it seems like he's um, more, he's optimistic. Optimism is good, yeah. So in any case, as far as DNF, which he already defines as an open problem in his paper, it took many, many years for some progress to be done. In, it can, I summarize here what, what has, uh, you, know, you know, it's NP hard in the general case. If you are requiring that, not only did I come up with uh, a description, an H, an hypothesis that describes what happens in the box, but this hypothesis is also the uh, DNF. But if you say, you know what, I don't care that it's a DNF, it could be another thing, some other algorithm expressed in some other model, then we can make some headway, and essentially um, the best algorithm known, speaking of headway, is two to the cubic root of N. But if you furthermore um, restrict the distribution to be a distribution like the uniform distribution, you can do a little bit better, uh, n to the power log n. And if you further say that the distribution is uniform and you're allowed to ask questions, you're allowed to ask membership queries, then Jackson in uh, 94, uh, about 10 years later, showed how to do this in polynomial time. 
So here we have one type of class, DNFs, okay? And this is the progress that's been done over the years, and there's an extensive effort still for people to understand this problem. So all this talks about machine learning. We are in crypto, 2018, not 17, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so where does the history of cryptography and machine learning start? So it really starts fairly soon after Valiant uh, comes up with this paper. And uh, because he asks a question, whether it was in the paper or it was informally a question that he asked Ron, that's why I have here, uh, there's Harvard where Valiant was sitting and there's MIT where Ron was sitting and there was uh, Michael Kearns who was walking between the two places. I think he was a graduate student here and he went to do a postdoc with Ron at MIT. So the question came up in, can we, okay, DNF maybe we can learn, other models we can learn. Can we show that there's something we cannot learn? So there is something in a box that has a polynomial representation, maybe even a simple representation, but we probably cannot learn it. Because as complexity theorists, you know, we kind of want to know the bounds of where we're working on. And um, in fact, there is a series of results. The first one is by Valiant and Kearns, which show that if RSA is secure, so if factoring is hard, if it also is another a candidate, then yes, there is some concept, okay, that cannot be pack learnable, okay? Um, and the proof is, if you think simple, essentially, what, is the, what are the examples? It's an RSA encryption with the modules and the exponent, and the label is maybe the least significant bit of the X that's been, that you see X to the E mod N. Um, and we know that this is as hard as essentially breaking RSA. So here we have a model which, if RSA is hard, cannot be pack learnable. But what about if we could ask membership queries? Then there is a sort of a formal treatment, even though informally sort of people understood this, by Pitt and Wormuth, where they say, you know what, if you have a pseudo-random function, okay, based on whatever assumption that you do, uh, then you can ask questions. And we know that even though you can ask questions, you cannot compute the label or the value of, the, of a pseudo-random function on another x. So that's another kind of immediate result you get. And what does it mean? Well, the, the more efficient your implementation of the pseudo-random function, the more it implies that there are lower complexity levels, where this, maybe this thing hidden in a box can be computed extremely quickly. And still, this doesn't mean that you can necessarily learn it, because this shows that there are such concepts which you cannot. And then there's lots of other results, some of them I was involved in, uh, which essentially show that the, if, the more we, let's say we think of a pseudo-random function, and we make it constrained like the last talk was uh, talking about, that is you make it so that you, if you, you have a key that allows you to compute the function on some inputs but not on other inputs, in a sense you can think of this as, I even give you a partial description of the, of the model that's hidden in a box, okay? And yet uh, you cannot uh, learn a, a, the model on any, on other values, okay? So in any case, there's, in some sense, every time that we have a cryptographic construction, and the more powerful you, we let the adversary be and we still show security, in some sense it's like saying, let the machine learning algorithm have more and more power, still they can't do it. Okay, so the thing is, uh, so far I just talked about the difficulty of classification, right? Because you have some uh, examples, you want to give it a label of plus or minus. What about generation? So those of you who maybe have seen, you know, there are these beautiful papers coming out of Google Brain or whatever, where they say, we can come up with, we see lots of cats, now we're gonna come up with lots of artificial cats. That is, we generate new cats. Um, not really new cats, but pictures of new cats, or new dogs, or new giraffes, or maybe successful college essays, or CVs that will get you a job, or slides for a keynote talk, that would be good, or plays by Shakespeare. <laughs> you know, maybe we could just see a lot of examples and now we're gonna generate something that looks indistinguishable. So this sort of uh, idea has been defined actually before this current sort of success with cats and so forth uh, uh, by Kearns, uh, uh, Mansour, Rubinfeld, uh, Ron, uh, Sally, and Shapiri. And there are, they, in fact, they define it formally. There's a distribution in a box. You can get samples. You can press a button and get samples of cats, if you like, if you think of cats. I don't know. There's an obsession with cats. I don't even like cats. But <laughs> let's say dogs. There, there is, there is, a, there is a, you can get lots of dogs. And now you'd like to come up with a, a, your own a, a small algorithm, which generates things which cannot be distinguished between uh, the original distribution and your distribution. And of course, there's a question of how you define it. You cannot distinguish, OK? Is it, a no, is it your model that cannot distinguish? Is any polynomial time algorithm that cannot distinguish? I will, I will leave that aside. But even that, uh, you know, we could show, in fact, there's some paper by Naor, which is more sophisticated than what I'm saying is, but essentially saying that if there are digital signatures, which are secure against chosen message attack, then there exists a family distribution which are hard to generate, OK? But even though you can actually uh, 
in some sense recognize the distribution as valid. So there's some notion of evaluating the distribution as correct or incorrect, even evaluating the probability that something comes up, and he shows a special signature scheme where, which violates the ability to do it for this particular concept defined by the signature scheme. All right, so, so far, it looks like what's cryptography done for machine learning? It's told them what they cannot do, okay? Well, something. Um, and in fact, the, uh, machine learning has sort of returned the favor in spades. In a paper in 93 by uh, Lipton, Blum, I'm blanking. Lipton, Blum, two others. They introduced the problem called learning parity with noise. So they actually write explicitly in their paper, if you look it up, they say, you know, uh, modern cryptography has had considerable impact on the development of computational learning theory. Virtually every intractability result in valence model comes from some cryptographic hardness. So now we're, they're saying we're going to give back because what we're going to do is we're going to give uh, results in the reverse direction by showing how to construct cryptography from some assumptions on the difficulty of learning. Okay, so they're saying here's a problem that we have focused on in the learning theory, okay, it's sort of natural for learning people to look at, and we claim that you can use that as a core for building crypto systems. So what's the problem? The problem is this. You've got a bunch of equations in, in variables, uh, sorry, they're all S's, secrets, or X's. Well, they should be either all S's or all X's, but I think uh, depending on when I was working on the talk, I, I changed my mind. In any case, there are these v secret variables, S1 through Sn. We don't know what they are. They're binary. It's a binary vector. We've got some uh, equations in these, in these uh, variables. The thing is, if we really did have equations, we could do Gaussian elimination and find their secrets. But we don't have it. We have noisy equation. What does that mean? It means that we take the value of the equation and we flip it with some probability rho. And, um, and that's what you see. You see the coefficients. You see the answers, noisy answers here, and you don't see the, the variables. And that's your goal, to come up with S1 through Sn. So here is a problem, beautifully, clearly stated problem. Of course, it becomes easier or harder depending on this noise. So it, you know, the closer it is to a half, the harder it is, right? If it's a, but they define it for constant probability, if it, let's say with probability one third or something like that, and, um, and showed some cryptographic constructions based on them, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what do we know about this problem, really? You know, there's RSA, let's say it's based on factoring, it's been around for a long time. What do we know about this problem? What we know is that since 93, the best algorithm known is, runs in time two to the order n over log n, essentially exponential. And this was a breakthrough, because exponential is trivial. Um, and it took many, many years, this is work by Rakursky, Lubyansky, by Nathan and Wicks, to show more cryptographic-like properties of this function. And what they showed is sort of worst case to average reduction, but with very, very um, high noise. So this was not really a constant noise, but pretty close to one half, okay? But so it's saying when the problem is really hard, okay, we can show worst case to average, which worst case problem actually not such a hard problem. So in some sense, you know, the noise, it makes it a very hard problem, and the equivalence is to an easy worst case problem, but it's something, because it's taken a very long time to show anything, okay? Um, now, the biggest real revolutionary um, implication of introducing this learning parity with noise comes with this work of Regev in 2005. Because Regev says, you know what? Forget about p equal to two. Over working over uh, Boolean secrets. Let's go and work on a field in, uh, in ZQN here, so everything is mod Q. We take all our integers and Z, uh, all our, um, our variables are from ZQ, our coefficients are from ZQ, and the noise is no longer flipping because we have an element in ZQ. So let's add Gaussian noise in some sort of bounded intervals, small Gaussian noise, okay? And he says, you know what? This problem generalized the previous one, right? Because Q, Q just went from two to something larger. Boolean went uh, to Gaussian. What about this problem? Well, it's certainly not any easier, okay? The thing is that now we can start working. So what Regev shows in his original paper is that this problem really is, is as hard as some hard lattice approximation problem, not an easy one, and that this is actually also hard on the average. This is dovetailing on work by Aitai, which showed worst case to average a, a reductions. So we know now that we have a problem which we can actually prove something about. So it's as hard as a problem that's been studied uh, in geometry. You know, it's finding a short vector in an integer lattice, actually in an approximate sense, but still, it's kind of something one can bite their teeth into. But, you know, teeth, depends on the dentist, I guess. But in any case, it's, a, it's still the best known algorithm is two to the, 
you know, big over and over log in. It's a different algorithm today, but the running time has not been improved from the LPN. So uh, this is not surprising in some sense because this is a harder problem, but there's a lot more machinery, maybe a lot more structure and so forth. Um, the thing is that's revolutionary about this introduction of Regev is not just that he can prove things of worst case to average, is that it's extremely versatile cryptographically. So this is the problem, really, that allowed people to start thinking and actually achieving homomorphic, fully homomorphic encryption. Not just homomorphic encryption for one or two operations, but really for any polynomial time algorithm. So for any sequence of operations, um, we can do things like leakage resilient cryptography, functional attribute encryption, and much, much more. So it's, un, it's really revolutionary in the sense that this is a problem one can work with and do things we didn't know how to do before. Okay, so in fact, if you look at this, is a slide that thanks to Daniel Masny, sort of uh, he on one hand talks about what you can do with learning with errors, another place what you can do with learning parity with noise, and these uh, uh, axes talk about the noise level. So as the noise becomes, uh, you know, essentially uh, smaller, the problem becomes easier. Okay, um, no, sorry, as the noise becomes, yes, okay, become, becomes easier, uh, and therefore you can do more. Uh, because, you know, in some sense you can do more, probably you can break it, you know, and so forth. Well, let's not go there. Uh, but in any case, you can do more, whereas with learning parity of noise, you really can do stuff only in kind of the high, high noise regime. So what are, when I mean when I say do stuff, you know, you do the usual thing. You start with, um, uh, let's say, sort of random number generators, which can do on one-way functions. Then you go to public encryption that requires some sort of um, trapdoor ability. Then you go to hashing, and uh, then you talk about pseudo-random functions, homomorphic encryption, and so forth. So in more and more things we want to do, we can do them with learning with errors. With learning parity with noise, people are working very hard to do them as well. Because the feeling is that that's kind of, you know, why, why actually, what is the feeling? So the feeling is that it's much more efficient. It's not a feeling, because working mod two is much more efficient. When we are working mod uh, Q, and Q is large, we're talking about large integers, the whole arithmetic costs more. So there's some att very attractive idea that we can make all of this work with the learning parity with noise, but everything is Boolean. Great. Oh, one more thing. There's huge quantum significance to this whole development because, as you know, we can build quantum computers. I don't know if you were in uh, Scott's talk, but it's really around the corner. In fact, he says it is around the corner in downtown Santa Barbara. Um, in any case, Google, Microsoft, IBM, many other companies are out there trying to build quantum computers for a significant number of quantum bits. You know, this is the cartoon that always comes up here is how's your quantum computer doing? Great, the project exists in a simultaneous state of being both totally unsuccessful, not even started. And he says, can I observe it? That's a tricky question. So it's a cartoon, but it has a lot of truth in it. It sort of brings up the open problems. How do you observe it? How do you verify it? And so forth. And what do you do with it in any case? Um, so the thing is that that's all very nice to laugh. But if this actually takes off, you know, we've got all those applications, electronic commerce and quantum uh, and, and cryptocurrencies and all that. And that's has to be based on something which will be quantum resilient. And therefore, NIST has come up with this call for post-quantum cryptography. And what does this have to do with my talk? It has to do with the fact that essentially all the candidates come uh, that, are, that are in a one version or another of learning with errors, or basing on learning with errors. Because this problem that came from learning theory is, seems so far to be quantum resilient. So whereas we know how to factor on a quantum computer where it to exist, we don't know how to solve these problems on a quantum computer where it to exist. So at least it's a candidate that we can sort of bite our teeth into and develop signatures, encryption scheme, and so forth that could replace possibly what's in store right now. All right, so who is that? It seems like what I said is that the bliss for cryptography is a nightmare for machine learning. And if that were when my talk would end, I would choose a different topic. Because, you know, you know okay, so they can give us hard problems, we can tell them they can't do anything. Um, that's not where the story ends. That's kind of the middle of my talk. I hope I have more time. Yeah. Um, so, so the reason I did go through that first part where we showed impossibility results is because I think that these impossibility results may be positive news for the second part of the talk. The fact that there are some tasks the machine learning algorithms cannot solve is not necessarily a bad thing. OK, so let's just keep that in mind. Um, so um, now let's move from the 80s, okay? So that all was 86, even though people, oh, or 84, even though lots of results continue. Kind of the thrust of the definition is from 84. So what's happened since? 
So in some sense, I'd like to compare where we are as, in cryptography as a field and how I see machine learning. And Adi's sitting here, and his son is one of the kings of machine learning, so probably he would disagree with me, but I don't care. So in any case, uh, I mean, I do care, but we will discuss it later. So <laughs> in, in cryptography, I think that if you think about theory and practice, OK, I think what the, the fabulous part about this field is that uh, over the years, they've gotten closer together rather than apart, in the sense that people in practice are actually implementing things which satisfy some theoretical definitions, and quite well. And it's only getting better. So as a field, we have accepted the role of theory. And in some sense, it's fundamental to the question of cryptography. Because without sort of rigor, without proofs, what are you giving? You give me a system, and you're claiming it's not going to break. And tomorrow it breaks. You have to give me some analysis. You have to give me some formal guarantees. In machine learning, it's more like algorithms, right? If it works, it works. <laughs> But what does that exactly mean is unclear. But in any case, if I had to use the same cartoon of theory and practice, the theory of machine learning is doing great. But the excitement right now, right this second, August 2018, is really in the practice. You know, essentially, uh, with these deep neural nets. Uh, and to a large extent, it's lacking theory and has to be developed. So there's some kind of a departure here between theory and practice. And um, the thing is, this is a terrible slide, but I will read it, that the practice of machine learning is really too important to leave for practice. Okay? Why is that? Because people are claiming, and it's used in many ways, and I believe it also, that it's going to help us to disease, for disease control, uh, to predict financial markets, for you know, advertising, for economic growth, uh, for traffic uh, control, for facial recognition, for speech recognition, for threat prediction, for even computer viruses and spam and so forth. And if you notice that last three bullets, OK, about policing, bail, and credit rating, you know, that's a bit, we're going, we're kind of sliding to a kind of a dangerous zone, where this is, there are, if you read the popular press, next time you apply for a loan, a machine learning algorithm will decide if you get it or you don't. If you are police chief and you need to decide where to send your police units, you will run a machine learning algorithm that will tell you where to send them. And where, if you're a, a judge and you need to decide whether to release someone on, may, on bail or not and you're lazy, then you just run a machine learning algorithm that analyzes the data of the past. In fact, this is not just my slide, but apparently in New Jersey, uh, you know, the judges are using these algorithms developed by some company that had access to all the information of, of judges deciding on bail in the past to decide on bail. And other states are considering it. Uh, another thing is that I think this is in New Orleans where they're using a machine learning algorithm to decide where to send the police cars. So, so this is actually being used, OK? Now, what does that mean? That means, really, that there's a sudden shift of power. Things that have been decided before by people, and you say people, they, who people, we don't like them, they're not smart enough. Still, we have to realize that now it's an algorithm that's going to make decisions about things which are quite important. So there is a sudden shift of power. So we just have to kind of recognize that. And maybe it's a good one. But it's certainly a fact. Um, and in fact, this is a slide that from Maya and Farinha. So uh, there's some analysis about the largest companies by market cap. Used to be the oil companies like Exxon and, uh, and banks and so forth. And now in 2016, these are all, these are all high tech companies. You know, Apple and Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft. And there are these quotes saying that data is the new oil, you know, these data companies. And data will become a currency. So why am I saying that? Is because this shift of power okay, is going to those companies, it seems, that have a lot of data. Since a lot of this prediction is based on knowing the past and having a lot of data about the past. And um, essentially, this can leave us sort of unprotected, unregulated, and so forth. So these things that you hear all the time, and you now you hear it again. So the thesis for the rest of my talk is that this is that essentially cryptography is a field for many, many years. Uh, we have paid attention to how to ensure the privacy and correctness of computation, right? So we have developed lots of methods, you know, whether they're using uh, multi-party computation or, or when you talk about com computing with private, on private data, or interactive proofs when you talk about verifying that the computation was done correctly. We've got a lot of tools. And this means that we are really, uh, we should be able to play a central role in ensuring that the power of algorithms is not abused, OK? I, I think that it's very, very clear that that's the case. Now the question is just to do it. So uh, what I've done is, essentially, I came up here with like eight or 
eight challenges, okay? Some of them are actually challenges that are already being attacked, and let me just go through them as quickly as I can so I can tell you actually what's being done today. So first of all, if we think about this as power of machine learning, where does it come from? It comes from data. Data about whom? About us, about individuals, right? So data about where we drive, who we talk to, what we like to buy, and so forth, and our, our, our gen genetic profile, and so forth. So obviously, ensuring the privacy of both the data and the model during the training and classifying, even if it's not mandated by regulations, OK, is in a, a, way, uh, a way to maintain this power to the people, sort of. <laughs> so privacy is, is, is crucial. Because machine learning stands to really change the way you know, life goes. And um, secondly, you know, OK, so let's say that the inputs are private. And now there is a model uh, that some company developed for the state of New Jersey or the state of um, um, Louisiana okay, to use for, for bail or police. But who says that that model actually fits the data? And who says that it hasn't been tampered with, maybe for bias or some sort of trapdoor, so that if you want at some critical juncture to make sure that somebody who's important to you goes out on bail, gets a loan, doesn't get uh, tracked by the police. So th this is clear. You know, it's, it's obvious, right? We have to make sure that these things are done in a tamper-proof way. And uh, the question is how. The extra benefit of these two challenges is that it's an opportunity for using stuff that we, could, we for many years, were writing lots of papers and we had schemes, but who's using them? Well, now, because of the blockchains, because of this application, I think it actually will be used. But it's a side benefit. You know, it's more important, really, that, to address these challenges. That's a lot of things that people are doing, and I will talk about it in the third part of the talk. All right, next thing. So you, Alex Madri put this slide up. Um, so people have probably heard this term, adversarial machine learning. The idea of adversarial machine learning is that, let's say there's a model, and you can either look at it, okay, and try to come up with an example that you feed that model, an input, this is after the training phase, in the second phase, that it's gonna misclassify. So here it seems useless. Why do you wanna misclassify the pig as an airliner, it's like a kosher airliner, or a non-kosher airliner, <laughs> and uh, so it's not at all. <laughs> A, why would you want to do that? Well, that's not, that's entertaining for talks, but you know, people talk about the self-driving cars, you don't want them to misclassify a swap sign for a yield sign, or even things close to home. What if you have software that's intended to find something as a virus or something as a spam, and someone can just tweak the spam message or tweak the virus so that your classifier doesn't catch them, just by playing with it a little bit. So when I say playing with it a little bit is essentially you can, these results of turning the pig into, into you know, I don't know, United, is, uh, is uh, these results don't require actually having a lot of information. They require being able to ask questions back and forth from a classifier a, of images, you know, the pig recognizer. Um, the thing is, of course, it's not totally honest because when they ask questions back and forth, they ask a lot of questions. That's one. Two, when you get an answer, it's not just telling you pig or airline. It actually tells you the probability that it's a pig or the probability it's an airline. So it actually gives you a bit of information about how your underlying uh, machine learning algorithm is working. But the fact is that you can misclassify things galore. Um, and um, you know, what do we have to do with this? Well, as cryptographers, we really do have a vast experience in mathematical modeling of adversarial behavior. So they're playing. Uh, and it, it's incredible because this uh, very small uh, perturbations of these images can yield these incredible uh, consequences. But how do you actually go about fixing this? Okay, so you would think that you would need to define formally what are the class of changes that can be done, and then prove security with respect to these class of changes. Okay, um, and in fact, there is work by Madri that he talked about yesterday, which is exactly what he does. So he looks at images, and then he defines a class of attacks, okay, which are domain specific. So what would you do to an image? You may rotate it, you may shift some pixels. So he defines this class and then he proves things. What does he prove? So first of all, he has uh, this notion of robust training, where when he's training the net, uh, his algorithm, he's also giving it some adversarial examples. Adversarial according to the class that he's defined before. And then he shows that once he does that, misclassification is much harder. Misclassification, of course, restricted to the adversarial behavior that he proved against. Then he shows um, that uh, some bounds. He says, look, I could do this, okay, and it's a good thing to do, but how much more work is it? Training 
a machine learning model is not simple, especially not the kind of models that he's looking at with image classification. So how much more data do you need in order to train a robust, uh, a, a robust network, a robust to those transformations that he's defined? But my point in all of these results, which are fascinating, is that he defined the class of transformations and then he proved security with respect to the, or adversarial robustness with respect to that class. And to me, it's extremely reminiscent to the days of leakage resilience, where we had those beautiful papers on timing attacks and, and cache attacks and um, give me another attack. <laughs> Acoustic attack. <laughs> no, seriously, so these things were amazing. They like, would break RSA or they would break these schemes. And then what you want is to actually define larger classes, and of course you want them to include these uh, attacks and prove something mathematically with respect to those attacks. And it seems very similar, even though I, I, I know that it's different. But in spirit, I think it is similar. Okay, next thing. Um, yeah, okay, so the holy grail in this adversarial machine learning, I think, is, and I think everybody knows that, is that we want to build somehow a model that will embed in it a challenge. So that if you, uh, that in order to misclassify, you would have to solve this challenge. Nobody knows how to do that. It's very difficult, right, because everything is so empirical. A challenge, what? A challenge that looks like a plane, and, you, and it's a, and it, but regular schemes, I mean, regular planes, you know, they should be classified as planes without having to embed cryptographic challenges in them. I'm not saying I know how to do it, but it's clearly the holy grail. And this relates to the Debbie Downer thing, because, you know, if we think about uh, what we talked about in the first part of the talk, it was how to come up with counterexamples to learning, right? So in some sense, this might give us some sort of a guideline of how to start uh, working toward this holy grail. Okay, next. Next challenge, so we've left adversarial machine learning behind. So there's all these laws coming up, which are good laws. I mean, they're not really necessarily well written, but they have good intentions. So there's GDPR, and now there's a California law, a digital privacy law, which essentially grants consumers more control over and insight into the spread of their information online. So regardless of what the law actually says, what is the point here? They're saying it would be the, the consumer should know if a company has its data that it's giving it to another company, or at least that it's giving it in such a way that it's not going to be able to be traced back to him or harm him in some way. So in other words, we want ways to trace the unauthorized use of your data uh, and of your model, and it means that it would be very interesting to develop methods which uh, could be used for uh, tracing data, of course, without introducing more vulnerability, because it seems obvious that if I introduce ways to trace my data, I'm actually introducing a way to find out about me. Okay, so wait a second. But you know, these type of problems don't really bother us because these paradoxes we've solved before. And here is a, a conjecture from the reception yesterday, uh, <laughs> discussion with uh, Mary Waters and Guy Rothblum, is that maybe you could show that data tracing is possible unless some sort of privacy-preserving learning algorithm was used. So it's a double-edged sword. Maybe you could show that if you can't trace it, it's because they use, I don't know, differential privacy or something else. And then that would be good. It would be almost a proof that they use uh, a data, uh, <clears throat> a privacy-preserving method with your data. Okay, next. Um, what about tracing the unauthorized use of the model? So this is uh, a beautiful work, a, sequ a sequence of works. By the way, I am going to be really, a lot of people are going to be upset at me because I don't reference many things. But you really should not be upset at me because I can't, okay? So, you know, <laughs> it's too much and I can't remember the names and so forth. But in any case, here's one paper that appeared in Usenix, I remember uh, Benny Pincus, and uh, where, where, uh, just uh, last week, where they show how to water watermark a model. So their idea in some sense, and they have this beautiful title, Turning Your Weakness Into Your Strength. Uh, by the way, that's one thing that this field has. The names, fantastic. You know, every system has a beautiful, I don't know, there's so many acronyms, it, it's, I'm, I'm at odd, people coming up with these names. But in any case, what they mean is, is that they watermark the uh, deep neural nets by training the network to accept some planted adversarial examples. So in some sense, the fact that there are adversarial examples in the kind with the pig and the airline, they're saying, you know, that's a good thing, I'm gonna put something in there that only I know that I put that's going to misclassify something galore, and it's, mis it's going to be essentially my watermark. Okay, uh, five, fairness, accountability, and debiasing. So right now there's this whole community, it's called FAT, Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency, where they uh, come up with definitions and, uh, and, and algorithms of how to take machine learning models and make them fair, okay? And Cynthia talked about that yesterday. I think that we have some crypto-style definitions which could be useful uh, where they talk about similar people have to be uh, 
uh, similar people have to be classified in a similar manner. What does similar really mean? How do they define that? There's some sort of metric. But it, to me, it seems that um, you know, definitions like uh, simulation-based or comput computationally indistinguishable might be very interesting here. Because in some sense, what you want to say is that with one person, you can do what you can do with the next. You know, I, I could give a whole talk on this, but, but I won't. Uh, then there's a the question of randomness. So at least for the machine learning models that I'll talk about in a minute, the neural nets, randomness seems to be very important. And I've never heard any discussion about what kind of randomness do you need to guarantee success? Is it a computographically strong? Is it unpredictable? Is, is it just uh, something else? A, how does it affect stability? Um, so I think that's a very interesting domain. We, as we know, at the end, randomness for generating secret keys, if it's done incorrectly, can be detrimental. And uh, they talk often about the brittleness of this, that you know, somebody comes with a neural net, and then somebody tries to reproduce it, they can't. Maybe it has to do with the randomness. Uh, or maybe the fact that you can translate adversarial machine learning examples from one model to the next, which is surprising, you attacked one and then it turns, seems to attack another, is because they use the same randomness or closely related randomness, I have no idea. But it's worth a study. Finally, I think that this is probably something that's very tractable, and that is define some specialized cryptographic functionalities which are sort of machine learning complete. So some cryptographic things which, could, if you did it well, you could implement sort of safe machine learning, and of course these have to be functionalities which are efficient, you know, for cryptography. All right, so I want to say, to end here and then go to my last part, is that this, there's a real opportunity here for developing new theory. And, um, and I think that that's great, you know, like how exciting. So what it, this is the third part and last part of my talk, and obviously I'm not going to get through all of it. Um, there is a lot of work on ensuring the privacy of both data and model during classification, during training, and some work on model stealing as well. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Okay, so if, if for a, um, so I'll say in a minute. I want to say that lots and lots of works, as I said, 50 or so, and really in some sense, if you think about it, we know a lot of these things are possible just by general results, right? How efficient is it? We know asymptotically. Then there's a question of how you, you write a system and you want to, you can analyze the concrete efficiency. Now we're in that stage of sort of proofs of concept. Now, I don't think any of these things are ready to be shipped off. Uh, but this is very natural progression of how these things go. Um, so I said that you could use cryptographic technologies of the past. What technologies? Everything. It's like the kitchen sink. You know, garbled circuits of Yao from 82, homomorphic encryption from Gentry and on, uh, secret sharing of Shamir, differential privacy, and multi-party computation. So all of these techniques come into play. So which one? Well, that's, that's a really good question. It seems like each one has their merit, depending on the, whether we're doing training or classification and what trust assumptions we're willing to make. And really what people are doing, it's like a Chinese menu, even though this doesn't look like Chinese food, but in any case, uh, it's sort of a pick and choose approach. You know, you sort of have all this technology out there, maybe I'm gonna use this, and then I'm gonna connect it here, and voila, a system comes out. Uh, and I mean it in the best possible way. So let's just see sort of very briefly the kind of things that are being done. So here is kind of a picture. There's a training phase, as we said, and there's a classification phase. So if you think about classification, what are the security issues anyway? There are two. On the side of the client who wants to sort of classify, you know, whether he's getting a loan or not, or I don't know what, something else, um, they want to keep their pri data private. So in this picture, it's a doctor that has the, uh, the, the images, the medical records uh, of her patient. And then the hospital who has developed the model because it had lots of patients and knows how to classify tumors as malignant or not, wants to keep the model parameters or the hypothesis secret. It worked pretty hard to get it. So there are these two competing, uh, two competing uh, concerns. And it seems like, okay, what do you want? Let's go home. Two-party computation. Yao already did it in 1982. Why do we have to even discuss this, okay? Performance, performance, performance. <laughs> so essentially, um, this is, I'm, I'm gonna skip this, but you can sort of talk about the pluses and minuses of using two-party computation versus using encryption that has some sort of homomorph homomorphic properties to it. The big line here, without looking at all these pluses and minuses, is that homomorphic encryption allows small communication. So sort of if you think about it, you're encrypting the input and you're encrypting the output, okay? Whereas garbled circuits and uh, uh, multi-party computation 
the communication is very high because it's proportional to the size of the circuit or the computation that you're doing, but computation is more efficient. So that's the tension here. There's other tensions, not the only one. The garbled circuits, they work on binary inputs. It's really for Boolean circuits. The homomorphic encryption, they work for arithmetic. So depending on whether your computation, your naive thing that you're doing starts being Boolean or starts being arithmetic, and in fact, often it will start working with real, real numbers, okay, you may prefer one technology over the other. All right, so I was gonna talk about some work that I've done in, the 19, in, in 2015, which is working on very simple classifiers, okay, like you know, linear classifiers, decision trees, um, you know, naive bays, in which case it's very clear that you wanna choose sort of an encryption scheme which can com where you can encrypt M and encrypt M prime and you can compare whether M was greater than M prime or not. That's kind of the basis of what you want or uh, of that sort and that's the kind of encryption scheme you would use in order to develop an, a classifier where both the input of the, the being classified is main, maintained in, uh, secret and the hyperplane, sort of what classifies as zero or one is maintained secret. But the real interesting game in town is not that. You see that dog? He doesn't look very happy, but uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I think I was in an aggressive mood when I was downloading these pictures. Um, so the real interesting question is, what about these deep neural nets, right, which everybody's saying is the future and, and is being utilized. What, what is the challenge, really, in classification and also in training? So the way that these things work, uh, there's this dog, and he's not physically being input. Obviously, it's a picture of a dog, which is a bunch of pixels, and each pixel has some kind of value, depending on what the color or um, sort of on some sort of grayscale, if you want, if you, if you wish, is inputted to the neural net. Then there's something that is called usually layers, and then at the end, there's an output, which is a bunch of nodes which have probabilities in them. Was this a dog? Was this a cat? Was this a man? Or was this no one? Uh, neither one of these three. And obviously, if this is perfect, the top blue one is going to have a one. It's a dog. Okay, at least I think it's a dog, although it's an angry dog. And then the others are all zeros, but that's not always gonna be the case. Now, what is the issue with cryptography? These, immediate, these intermediate orange balls, okay, what do they do? They essentially, there's some weights on these wires, and what they do is they sum these, uh, multiply these weights by the input variables, and then they compute something called an activation function on this value, which is a nonlinear computation, okay? So that's what we have to remember. There's sort of a bunch of linear stuff, you, um, um, Weighted sum, and then you do something nonlinear. Why is that important for cryptography? Um, because, you know, so what's, a, what's an example of these nonlinear functions? Logistic functions, uh, a, a, essentially a max, a hyperbolic tangent. In any case, the point is that our cryptography, our fully homomorphic encryption and MPCs are really good when what we're computing are low degree polynomials. So that was on the slide that I skipped really quickly. This is not a low degree polynomial which means that if the inputs come in encrypted and then we want to sort of evaluate this whole thing under encrypted input, and like say or fully homomorphic or MPC, whatever, it's gonna be hard because these are functions that are gonna require a very, very, very deep circuits to compute and we don't have, uh, essentially it's beyond our capacity because it would mean that we would need to do bootstrapping, we need, that means big parameters, uh, a lot of noise and, um, we can't do it as is. So the beauty is still that there is work, and I, you know, I, this first work that I've seen, it was a Microsoft a group by Kristen, is that they actually do it anyway. So what do they do? So the first work is CryptoNets. Essentially, first, a few problems to address. You, in these uh, neural nets, you, ha you, look, you, you have these fixed precision real numbers, and you need to convert them to integers because that's what the homomorphic encryption works with. And these, in, you're gonna multiply, you're gonna add, these things are gonna grow, you somehow have to make sure that it don't grow beyond what you can handle. Then there is a question of this uh, logistic or, or nonlinear function. What do you do then? So they say, okay, let's not use it. Let's use uh, a low degree polynomial which will approximate it well. And they propose to use a squaring function. The point is, so this is z squared there. Uh, so the point is that that's, I think that's a really, you know, big idea. Sort of trading accuracy in some sense for efficiency. So in other words, that's, um, and it, there's two ways to go here. One is to work really hard and to be able to do the logistic function, okay? And the other way is to go to the machine learning people and tell them, listen, this is better for us, okay? You wanna have secure uh, ML? Why don't you do your neural nets with these kind of functions? Whether it's this function, another one is a different question. So to my surprise, for example, Madri yesterday, who's extremely savvy in all of this, didn't know about this work, about the kind of functions that are used in intermediate neural nets in the 
script, crypto work. Okay? I think that Ohad Shamir and a few other people actually worked on analyzing the squaring function and how well it does compared to you know, logistic and so forth. This is the kind of work that should be major encouraged. Okay, this is not only uh, uh, FHE that's being, or homomorphic encryption that's being used in this context, but also uh, people in this work on deep secure took garbled circuits and optimized implementations for sigmoid, for tangent, those are the activation functions that are actually used by the machine learning people. So they didn't switch to some other functions, they took the one that are being used in the machine learning algorithms and did impl implementation specific optimizations. So then there is this rule that Vinod is telling me, when is FHE better than MPC? Because here it's FHE, here is multi-party computation. So here's a rule of thumb. If the computation is linear and the circuit size is super linear, use homomorphic encryption. Because your, circ your computation is too large okay, to use garbled circuits, and yet um, it's small enough uh, to uh, use homomorphic encryption successfully. And in fact, there's this work that was also in Newsweek just last, not Newsweek, Usenix. Uh, same difference, uh, by Dalika Nathan, Chuck, uh, whatever, Ananta and Chirag, uh, which they combine the two approaches. And essentially what they, uh, what they do is they say this, you know, there is that linear layer, right? So the encrypted uh, uh, inputs come in, and first of all, we sum. That we can do under homomorphic encryption. Now comes the nonlinear. So the suggestion now is that now there will be a protocol between the, cl the, per the classifier, the model holder, and the user who has the key for decryption, um, and uh, somehow they'll do a two-party computation to compute this nonlinear level, and now we go to the next stage. Of course, this whole thing makes sense only when either the model is something that you don't know or that there's some efficiency that's gained by this approach versus you yourself computing the model. So because you could imagine the model guy giving you an encrypted model, and then you go do it. Anyway, the issue is that uh, it's a very interesting work, good performance, and it key here is to combine these two uh, technologies. Um, I know that I'm kind of out of time. I'm going to take five more minutes, okay? No, two? Trust me, I know you, so I uh, took five minutes away, and I'm going to... Uh, ah, thank you very much. <laughs> so this is classifying. So linear classifier is simple. <laughs> you know, deep neural nets, difficult, okay? Um, what about training? So training, you know, is a nightmare as far as I can see. Because before we had to go through the system once and compute this nonlinear function, you know, at every level of the network. But now, um, you know, when I do training, essentially this is the canonical picture. So this weight one and weight two, we think about, you know, these weights on the wires that you do the weighted sum with. Um, we don't, when you train, you don't know what those weights are. So you start with something random and then you improve those weights you know, per what you learn from the training data, and you improve, 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 till you find a place where it's sort of optimal in some sense. The thing is that, uh, that uh, so in this picture here, these are the original weights, this is sort of the loss, so how good these weights are, and let's say you start somewhere here, and you want to really fall all the way here, to find the right W1, W2 in this case, but usually there are lots of weights that minimizes the loss of the classification. But how do you do that? You have a training input with the weights that you have right now, and you run it through the network, and then you see whether it classified well or not, and if it did, that's good, and if it didn't, it tells you how to change your weight, and then you use another input and so forth. Of course, they don't use one input at a time, because there's lots of inputs, but they take batches of inputs and do that, okay? But that's a lot of nonlinear operations. It's a lot of operations altogether, so I think this is a incorrect. It's worse. So if you compare training to the classification, it's going to be the size of the data. This is D, not the same D from before. The size of your data set, how many train examples are in your data set, and more. Okay? So uh, very difficult. Second of all, uh, we need lots of training examples. And often, we need to take them from many different uh, entities, maybe individuals, maybe companies, maybe hospitals. But the, the training data doesn't come from one source. So it's not two-party computation anymore, where there's somebody holding the data and somebody who wants to train. It's actually lots of people who may be contributing data and one that wants to train. So if you want to keep the privacy of those lots of people, how do you do it? MPC, that's right. Actually, true. Um, so there is a paper called Federated Learning, or a concept called Federated Learning, where they say, okay, let's say that uh, your training data is what you've typed on your laptops, and the machine learning wants to predict the next word. So if I write crypto 2018, the word keynote comes out, or something of that sort. Um, so the thing is, they, uh, they want to have lots of users typing and uh, develop a model from all those users' inputs. But they don't want, uh, the user, let's say, doesn't want to tell them what they're typing. 
So the idea with this is that you first, uh, what they suggest is, you know what, each user can locally train a neural net. Okay, so they have some weights, uh, so there's some initial weights that everybody knows, and then each one improves them depending on their inputs, and then they send the deltas in the improvement to the server. And their first argument is, look, just, I'm just sending the delta of the improvement, I'm not sending my inputs, so it's, I'm really better a little bit. It's not good enough because these, um, these deltas uh, can leak information about my inputs. So the second idea is instead of sending to me the delta in the inputs, we're going to split, so either over here, there was one server, we're going to split this to several servers, let's say three or four, and we're trusting somehow, so Google splits into three agents, and we're trusting that they don't all talk to each other, that at least somebody doesn't talk to, there's some non-collusion going on, and now they, each one, this guy secret shares his delta of the weights among those servers, they all get together and do a weighted sum. Weighted sum we know how to do, very efficiently. So that's the idea there. Um, and uh, what else do I want to say? I want to say that even though I had that beautiful picture and saying that training is a nightmare, it's being done. I, like, hats off if I had a hat. It's unbelievable. Sort of, uh, there's a lot of work on training approximate logistic regression and other kind of regressions. The main idea there, which again is a big idea, is, uh, is um, how to essentially approximate these standard computations like logistic and so forth by other functions which have similar performance and are friendly to cryptography. In fact, there is a, a very beautiful new homomorphic encryption, which the title is homomorphic encryption for approximate arithmetic. The idea here is you kind of say, you know what? We have always wanted, insisted that homomorphic encryption has to give me the same answers as the unencrypted computation. Let's relax that. It's not going to give the same answers. It's going to be approximately the same answers. When I, in any way, are using this for some uh, ex uh, application where I only need an approximation and I don't need exact computation, that's good enough. And that can make my homomorphic encryption much faster. So I think this is beautiful work, and this is an example showing how this machine learning, in my opinion, and logistic regression, motivated the invention of a completely new homomorphic encryption scheme. So it's really an example where this kind of goal has changed, in my opinion, cryptography. Okay, I think that uh, I'm going to skip the model stealing. That's differential privacy. I just want to say that we're really not done at all because in all of these things, in all these solutions, it's all honest by curious models. So we're trusting people to follow the protocol. But why should we trust them? What about people who are trying to modify things so that they can later be, get qual uh, qualified for a loan? So I think it's a fundamental question, and the stakes are too high to pretend it doesn't matter. You know. There's sort of three parts to it. How do you verify everybody is doing the right thing during the training? How do you make learning robust to adversarial inputs? So there's beautiful work on distributed optimization, saying suppose some of the inputs are actually bad, okay? That you make your optimization problem still uh, um, robust against those badly chosen inputs. And finally, you know, how do you verify the model has not been modified post-training? Okay, you've been extremely uh, patient and uh, my bottom line is this, you know, this whole machine learning thing, uh, fascinating, fascinating for cryptography. It's an opportunity to use things we've developed for many years, but more importantly, it's an opportunity to develop new theory, both for crypto and for ML, um, so that they work well together. And finally, I want to thank all these people who I kind of tortured with questions on this topic. Uh, and if I didn't mention you, you know who you are, so thank you. <laughs>